Welcome back. In this episode, we are going to start to apply color. That little chirping sound you hear in the background is just my air compressor maintaining pressure. So we've gone ahead and uh, primed all the parts that we're going to do. I couldn't get the turret apart. It's got rivets in there and I wasn't going to play that game. So I may incorporate that into the design later. I'm still deciding on that. Now, uh, for those of you who've never watched one of these videos before, welcome to all of my subscribers. Thank you very much and welcome back. And to everyone, we're going to kick off by applying some color. So in this airbrush series, we've been showing you the versatility of the airbrush and how uh, color selection and everything else not only becomes cheaper, but the application of the color becomes far more efficient. Certainly not limited to things like the weather outside or having a garage. So I'm set up at a, my hobby table in my house. The color I'm going to be using for uh, the, let's call it orange-brown parts of Sky Patrol, uh, is Vallejo Model Air Tan Earth. Uh, this is a new color I've found, so this will be an experiment that I'm going to bring you along with me uh, for. And I have a backup color, USAF Tan. The federal standard number is 20400. And uh, we'll try one of those two. I think one of those two will be good. The other thing that we're going to do for the regular color is um, Tamiya Acrylic RLM Gray XF22. It's a nice green gray that really matches the uh, gray used in um, Sky Patrol very nicely. Now, these are just going to be the regular colors because uh, to refresh your memories, we will be employing the Molotov Liquid Chrome in this project, which has uh, some unique properties to it, which we'll go over when I do that in a separate phase right now because that's going to take a lot of attention and there is some nuance to applying it. We're just going to deal with regular color application. And the one thing I noticed when I finished priming my Mobat was that having a completely black hull like this reminded me of the Crimson Assault tank or the CAT or the uh, Char d'Assault uh, from Consumers Distributing up in Canada here. And uh, I'm saving that for another project, so I will be doing a CAT. And we'll also have a discussion about using your powers for evil. So in other words, replicating something that's rare and hard to find and trying to pawn it off as the same thing so anyway carrying on so um, I'm just going to mix up my paint here with my dollar store cups if my dollar store cups will come out and play there we go so the first thing I'm going to do is in my pre-visualization, I actually flipped around some colors uh, just a couple of days ago. Remember we talked about coming up with a plan and making sure it works and you can be uh, super happy with it and carry on or you can be really happy with it and then when it comes to that final moment before applying the color you think, hmm, maybe that's not the best thing. And what I changed was um, where the brown was going to go and where the gray was going to go. There's not going to be any white on this one uh, like there would be, uh, for example, on the Sky Shark. Uh, in this case, I looked at the uh, Sky Havoc, and there isn't any white on it that I could see. Even the missiles are brown, so they kind of break their own color conventions as to what gets colored what, uh, what for their scheme there. So uh, in this case, I'm going to be making this turret gray. This I might make this whole thing uh, brown, actually, but the gun's going to be brown. The turret is going to be gray or brown, and then this whole gun is going to be brown as well with the chrome turret. So uh, I'm going to spray the brown first because... I wasn't able to remove this cannon and um, I'm going to get all the brown in there so this primer here will get messed up but that won't matter because of the nature of my my chrome product and then I'll protect the cannon while I uh, paint the turret. Uh, you could argue to do it the other way as well however um, as a proponent of trying to protect from overspray I'm going to try it this way first and see what happens. It may end up being six of one half a dozen of the other. Um, but that's kind of one of the choices you have, right? It's whatever your brain thinks will work well. And hopefully we'll get some better camera angles on this one for you. I'm going to leave the gun stuck on here because I'm going to use it as a holder for the uh, spraying of the uh, brown piece. In fact, we'll do that first. I'm going to put the turret aside here. So, uh, Vallejo Model Air. Uh, this is a mixing cup to thin paints for airbrush like we used in the last episode. Uh, in this case, you don't need it because this has been pre-thinned for airbrush. So I have uh, Vallejo model thinner and airbrush cleaner and all that stuff for the cleaning process. Um, but we can actually squirt this right from the bottle into the airbrush itself. So uh, as with anything else, we're going to shake it up first just to wake it up. 
because everything settles, right? Everything settles. So there we go. Oh, I like that color. Of course, I like it now. Uh, one of the things I found too is that when I'm doing these projects, is uh, you might like a color on the swatch. You might like it coming out of the bottle, but when it sits on the vehicle, you kind of go, mm. And that's another nice thing about airbrushes because the uh, paint isn't going on so thick. There's the paint in the cup there, straight out of the bottle, no thinners added because they're not required. Um, you'll find that uh, you can change your mind and it's uh, far less impactful for the most part when you're using an airbrush. Um, that's not to say you can't pool paint with an airbrush, you absolutely can, but it takes way more effort than doing it with a spray can. So now I have my trusty gloves on. I didn't show you those before because I deal mostly with acrylics, but I like keeping my hands clean. So I'm just gonna get my mask on here and same drills as before. So it'll take me a couple, couple of heartbeats here just to get the mask on if I take it off to explain something to you uh, in between steps. So all I'm gonna do is paint the cannon tip while it's still fixed to the turret as a holder and uh, just watch what I do there. It's very simple. In fact, we'll consider this a sound check if I talk you to through the mask and uh, I'll listen to it and hear if it sounds good. So here comes the spray booth. Already we have a jam in there. So give me two seconds, I'm going to fix that. Okay, and here we go.
Okay, and here's our real-time snag. So what's happening here is my airbrush has become clogged. I did a couple of checks there just to see, and I even thinned the paint in case the uh, thin, pre-thin for airbrush was alive, but I haven't had those kinds of problems with Vallejo Model Air before. So we are going to do this again. It's probably something that's stuck on the needle. One thing I found in uh, airbrushing with acrylics. It's kind of like when you have to keep your brush moist, except there's no real way to do that with um, airbrushing, except for making sure your paint's properly thin. But the, at the end of the day, what's going to happen is you can see there how there's paint build up there. It's not enough. You can still see that hole in the middle of the cap for the uh, paint to come through, but nonetheless, it is gathering. Um, there's the other side of it there, and it's pretty clear, so... Um, now what I've got to do is basically soak a bunch of, um, and there's the needle there, so it might have some stuff on it, um, but I am going to basically dump a bunch of airbrush cleaner or you can use rubbing alcohol that works too in fact let's use the rubbing alcohol because it's cheaper and we will put this through so bear with me here for a sec while I uh, do this this does happen from time to time and honestly it's my fault because I probably didn't um, clean it as well as I should have after my last session uh, and that happens especially I find with um, I'm just checking to see if anything comes out a chunk there. Put on the edge of that little bad boy. Um, you get excited, things start working out. If you set aside some time to uh, airbrush and things are working well, you keep going and then you uh, airbrush yourself at a time. So, right now, what I'm going to do is a neat little trick where the needles out of the the airbrush. I'm screwing the cap back on. You saw me do it a couple of times there. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to block the end of the airbrush with my towel, which forces the air back up through the airbrush and creates that bubbling effect you see there. Hmm. And all that does is it forces... Um, there, now see stuff's coming out. It forces stuff through the airbrush, back up through the airbrush, and can help dislodge it. So, after those few test sprays, I'm just going to put my mask back on here. Uh, somehow. <laughs> oh. I'm doing this one-handed here, so bear with me for a sec. Good enough. Now I'm just doing some tests to make sure that the flow is good. Now I'm going to reintroduce the needle into all that alcohol. Yeah, it feels much smoother now, the insertion of the needle. Sometimes you can tell if it's not good because there should be little to no resistance when you put that needle in there. Now let's check our spray pattern. Oh yeah. Alright, I'm just going to run the rest of that load through the cleaning station here. And there you have it. Some real-time troubleshooting. Um, this shouldn't, hopefully it doesn't put you off airbrushing. I found uh, with the learning curve of this thing, it's uh, cleaning is key. Um, and if something, if paint clogs up the airbrush, don't try and force it through. Just stop, unload your brush, and uh, use some rubbing alcohol on it. It's actually really good for a lot of the parts. 
and uh, don't get frustrated, which is kind of a key lesson here. Here we go. Let's see if that works. And now this time what I'm going to do is, even though it's pre-thin for air, I'm just going to put a little bit of thinner in there. Now the cool thing is, I didn't mix it in a cup. One of the other tricks for mixing is the same thing I did to cycle air through the airbrush. So I'm plugging the tip with some thick paper towel, and that airflow is actually mixing the paint and the thinner forming. So if all goes well, this should work just fine. There we go. Okay, and there we go for the first color. So I'm actually really happy with the value or tone of that color. I may have to go back and add another layer, but uh, so far so good. It's gonna shut the air compressor off here. And uh, yeah, so there you have it. Um, what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna switch colors. Now, switching colors with an airbrush, um, each time you do an airbrushing session, you should thoroughly clean your brush to prevent things like what just happened happening. And um, that's probably the best practice is take your time to do a good thorough cleaning. I guess I missed something when I did it last time. Um, in this case, when you're, when you're swapping colors, you want to get most of the color in. Um, let's call it like 95% of the color to kind of stick a number on it. And then uh, what you can do is just swap colors. Yeah, it'll mix a little bit in there, but only for the first few bursts. So once you clear those through your airbrush, you'll be airbrushing pure color anyway. So um, there it is. So that's about what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to have you stick around with that so you can see what I do. Um, but that was uh, 
to me a 10 Earth Model Air, and I'll say that the Model Air stuff goes through the airbrush well. I think the, what was there was what I what the problem was was that there was just some um, residue from me not doing a proper cleaning job. So don't let that turn you off from Model Air either. So we'll move on to the next color. So the next color requires definite thinning because it's not uh, pre-thinned for airbrush. And again, it's RLM Gray by XF22. And going through my color experimentation and matching is that when you look at Sky Patrol, the gray on there actually has a green undertone. Um, and we've talked about, you know, reddish browns and, you know, greeny blues and bluey greens and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like I said, when in doubt, um, just take your example to your hobby store or your art store and say, I need this color, what do you think that is? And then they'll, uh, they'll help you out from there as you get more used to uh, describing colors and seeing their, uh, their mixed values. So, yeah, hmm, I missed one big spot there. One big spot, always helps to quadruple check your work. So before I switch colors, I'm gonna shoot one little blast of tan in there. And it's right in there. There we go, now I'm just going to mix colors here, or switch colors. Okay, so that should be enough of a blast there to get the airbrush ready for the next color. That's a little awkward for me doing this because I've got this new camera set up here and trying to make sure that you can see it while I can see it. Um, so I'm not wasting airbrush paint. But, um, it's a little interesting. I was never very good at juggling when I was a kid. Here we go. Let's shake that up to wake it up. And here we go. So in this case, I'm going to do this um, with a much greater ratio of thinner. Because there's going to be a lot to do. I like to mix up a good large batch of this. Because, uh, well, we're going to need it. <laughs> so there you have it there. That's how much I'm going to do. And now I'm going to add in what to me is thinner. I'm going to use X20A. Uh, some people say you should use the lacquer thinner version of, but I'm going to get this down to. I know it looks like a very healthy doll I just put in there, but I'm kind of okay at measuring that stuff from the hip. So I'm just going to get a handy dandy brush somewhere. I'm just going to mix those two together. <clears throat> Let me run it up the side there just to see how it's coming together. And that is not nearly enough thinner. It's always better to 
undershoot, I guess, than overshoot, because then you end up mixing a cup that's all the way full. And <laughs> what are you going to do then, right? So, like I said, there's uh, certainly uh, measurable ways to do this. Most people do a bare minimum 50-50 mix of this. Sometimes it's 70-30. Um, you just got to experiment. So let's say at least 50-50 mix. Um, to uh, get things going here. If that's skim milk, then... Uh, Now we're actually, well, we're about 50 50 mixed there, so I'm gonna be dangerous and see what happens when I throw that in my hand. I'm sure there might be professional model builders watching this just shaking their head. And, well, that's fine. I'll just do a little bit. Or that much. <laughs> There's color coming out. Let's give it a whirl.
then well, there you go. So, as you can see, <coughs> I've started to paint the wheels there. I've got good flow to the airbrush, so that was a good mix. That was about 50 50 uh, mix of paint and thinner. I'm using the same Q tip blue poster tack setup I was for applying the primer to these road wheels. So now I'm going to go through and paint them all. So I uh, saw the <coughs> success of the application on three of the road wheels so far. I'm going to go ahead and do the rest. You don't need to watch that. This video is getting a little long anyway. So I'm going to finish uh, applying that color and just seeing the, uh, the road wheels on the hull already uh, compared to the turret and everything this is really starting to come together. Um, so what I'll say to you uh, in parting is uh, if you get hung up in your airbrush mid paint session just stop, unload your brush, give it a clean and don't clean one thing taut like and think that might be it. Just I, I went through the needle, checked it, went through the cup, checked it, cap, and then I said, screw that, and I pulled the whole thing apart. Um, honestly, the, it's not a waste of time, because it'll, unless you just do it all in one shot, you'll uh, waste your time going back and forth and back and forth, or just constantly thinking that it's the needle itself or the, the housing itself, and just redoing the same thing over and over again with uh, expecting different results. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you have any other questions or comments, leave them down below. and. Uh, Please like and subscribe, and we will see you next time. Uh, we'll show you the end result of the parts that have been painted so far, and then we'll get into uh, the chroming bit. So until next time, be safe and have fun.
All right, we finished the cleaning or the uh, airbrushing process. Now we're going to give this thing a detailed cleaning. So all we're going to do is we're going to disassemble the brush, and I've already functionally cleaned it or field cleaned it, let's call it. Now I'm going to loosen the nut. And a good way to do this, unfortunately, I can't find where my wrench went, but this little nozzle up front here comes off with a wrench, and it's always best practice to pull your needle all the way through. Um, that way you're not dragging the needle back through the body and depositing uh, paint and residue of any kind there. So here's the cool part. We've seen it down to this stage already, and my cap is already off and soaking in some rubbing alcohol. But now we're actually going to disassemble the whole thing. So the screw nuts come off. Now we're going to take out the needle... Um, retention assembly here. You can see everything's kind of falling to the back. We're going to pull out the trigger. The trigger spring guardy thing. It looks there. Technically the nozzle comes off but I've already given this a thorough cleaning and that's my fault so I apologize. But take your nozzle off uh, too if you can. Be very careful because those are very fine parts. Um, my, one of mine snapped once. It cost me $25 to replace it. So, um, And then this just slides apart. So you take out the inner assembly, the spring, and the cap there, the outer assembly. And all this stuff gets soaked in rubbing alcohol. So there's your detailed strip of your airbrush, and of course there's your siphon cup right there. All of this, uh, for the most part, can get soaked. Even this comes off from the air hose. Uh, you want to avoid prolonged soaking uh, of any of your rubber parts, your seals, your gaskets. Uh, there's a gasket down in the air hose there. Um, and just on the inside, I'm going to use the back end of my needle to point. Never use the pointy end because you might dull the needle. But right there is the valve for where the air comes in and out, and sometimes that can get gummed up too. So a quick wiping with some alcohol, then dry it off, will preserve it. Um, and there's some lubricants you can get to put in there. Just go to your local auto body shop and tell them what you got. So once these things are all cleaned, you can actually reassemble the whole thing. So that just sits together. Be careful, some of the stuff is spring-loaded or it will be under tension once you properly seat it. Um, I'm not going to tell you how many times I've had stuff just go flying because it doesn't want to be there anymore. Uh, and this is the, the care and love of an airbrush that extends the, uh, the life of the tool and gives you um, the ability to do everything you want to do with your paint. So I know that probably didn't make sense. It's because I'm trying to do something very complex while talking and that's not exactly my strong suit. So there we go. And we'll all this stuff too is finger tight. You don't need any tools to refund it or anything like that. Um, everything's finger tight and finger loosened. Uh, with the exception, you'll need a tiny wrench or some kind of tool to get the nozzle off. Um, sometimes it can come off with your finger, sometimes not. But like I said, be very careful with that part because it's uh, more fragile than you think. And yeah, it's already coming together. Needles in. Secured. I think I just put a part in backwards. You're welcome. <laughs> well, if I was perfect all the time, I wouldn't be here, right? Let's get that assembly back out. And what I think I did wrong was I put this. This one gets me every time. Even if I go to memorize it, I always flip it. So it should be curved and forward. And I could look it up, I guess, online or something like that real quick, but where's the fun in that? Uh, I was just watching a video recently of uh, someone I consider to be a professional model builder. And uh, they were telling uh, their viewers about their trials and tribulations of building resin models. And after years of doing it, and quite honestly, not exactly enjoying it, um, I stopped doing them. And it turns out that this person had the same problems, and they were putting out movie quality miniatures or, or model kits um, of some very famous subjects and I thought oh my god this person's talking about all the problems I've been having so it's not just me it's the model that sucks no I'm just kidding um, it's always nice to know that uh, even the pros have problems and uh, I'm not calling myself a pro by any stretch but I'll tell you, sometimes I've just wanted to bang my head off a wall and throw something right in the garbage, some whatever project I'm working on. But uh, that's definitely the key time, like we talked about in the beginning, to walk away. Frustration can't be avoided. Um, 
but I would say that it could be mitigated. There we go. Gonna let gravity do the work for me. Hopefully. Okay, so now that's sitting maybe where it should be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hopefully. We'll see. So I'm screwing the needle chuck back in. And we'll test it by trying to put the needle in. And when you take it apart and put it back together, you should have no resistance. There we go. No problem. Okay, my cap is still soaking. I'm getting some long-term gunk off it. In the meantime, I'll put the cap back on. And the cup back in. Whoa. There we go. Come on. Daddy's got gotcha. you. Daddy doesn't got gotcha. you. There we go. Finally, home machine. So in the meantime, while the cap is soaking, I have to protect the needle and the uh, the tip itself. So this is going to go sit in my little airbrush cradle uh, out of the way. I'll point it in a safe direction so that we don't catch up on anything. And the one thing that's soaking in here, this is screwed on tight, you might be able to see right in the back there, that's the uh, airbrush nozzle itself. Um, given the action and the way it works, is a lot of the uh, paint can get stuck inside the, the very tip of it and can get gunked up on the inside too. So uh, to show you some of the tools I use for cleaning my airbrush, we got a toothpick here, we got a used cotton bud, used clean ones. I've got some paper towel. Um, on the money side of the house, I've bought these micro brushes. Quite honestly, they're, they're indispensable uh, when doing airbrush cleaning. And then from the dollar store, I've got some pipe cleaners and you can run these through most of the uh, nooks and crannies and tubes and whatnot of your airbrush. So those are the basic tools there. I've got some rubbing alcohol here. You can use airbrush cleaners, whatever you want for your choice, but that's the size of it. So you can do a quick clean between tr color transfers. You can do a good clean when you're done, but when you're finished your session for the day, it is absolutely uh, important for you to disassemble the airbrush like I just showed you and clean everything. Uh, I use rubbing alcohol because it's the cheapest. And that'll ensure long-term life of your airbrush and good functioning throughout with a minimum of hiccups when you start loading your airbrush up for the first time on your next session. So there's your cleaning tutorial and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Have fun.